Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. I have done 233 episodes in about a year and a half of uh, the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. And uh, looking at AACP this weekend, uh, their meeting, and while they are probably one of the smallest organizations, what they do in their meeting sets the tone for the rest of the organization. So I think they have about five or 6,000 members. Where if you look like an APHA, they have like 60,000 members, or ASHP, which is a little bit less than that. What you really want to look at is what are they doing in terms of preparation for the next year. And what I'm seeing is, and to be fair, they have like a section that's just for admissions people uh, to help them uh, better understand FarmCast, to help them... Uh, with the recruiting and all of those things. But it's clear from the presentations that are coming up this year that there is absolutely no plan for a reduction in the number of students. That's not saying it, they couldn't go down, but I'm just saying that there was not one single, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there was not one single presentation on the recommendation that came out of the ASHP document that the number of pharmacy students going in should go down or should meet uh, what the demand is. So this is not to judge what they do or what they don't do. Uh, This is only to say, okay, well, if they're going to continue to maintain the number of graduates, which it looks like they are, there's a new school that just came out um, in L.A. So there's still new schools coming. There's still new schools that haven't graduated their first class. Uh, what can we do? So the first thing to do is say, okay, well, if things are like that and they're going to stay the same in terms of number of students coming out, then uh, that's going to make residency or getting residency even harder. So that's why I made the decision to uh, change up and go to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast because my, my goal with all of this has always been to get you the best information for your most pressing need. And your most pressing need uh, is to Either get a job if you're just graduating, come back to a job if you've unfortunately lost it, or um, make a pivot in some way or another that uh, residency might be the thing for you. So we'll also talk to people that aren't doing residency, why they chose not to, uh, what they're doing outside of residency and all that. But I just want you to know that what I'm projecting is that This is going to be the very first year that everything changes. So each year for the last couple years, the number of residencies has gone up by about 300. And the number of people wanting to do a residency has gone up by about 500. But the number of applicants, at least in the farm cast, uh, each year has not really changed. The number of people going to pharmacy school has not really changed uh, over the last four years. So what's happening is that for some reason there is more interest in getting a residency. But this year is special because of the issues that happened in terms of uh, layoffs, because of the issues that are happening with underemployment and all those things. The gap between a job that would be full-time, and I hate using this word, uh, pharmacist pay, Uh, And residency pay is narrowing to the point that it may be insignificant. So what also is going to happen is that those that are not able to find positions this year and those that have lost positions this year also are potential applicants for the match. So my prediction or projection is that it's not going to go up another 500 but it's going to go up another thousand. And that is going to be a big deal in terms of competition for the match. Because I don't know if they'll be able to continue to push another 300, another 300, another 300, because we're going to, we've started losing some of uh, the residencies because of funding, because if you have salaries that are coming close to residency salary for a practicing pharmacist with experience, why would you have a residency program? And in many cases, this doesn't fit. 
but in some cases it does. And so they'll just say, well, you know, let's just not have this turnover every year where we have to train somebody all over again. Let's have somebody who's going to stay with us for a long time. So my point or my thesis that I'm getting to is that the match will be even more competitive this year than it ever has been. So the topic today, what I want to go over is understanding enrolled versus participating in the match. When you look at your pharmacy school's website, and many have, not all do, but many have the match rate, and especially those that match really well. And so what you're seeing is some schools are above the national match rate, 64%, and some schools are below the national match rate, 64%. What's happening, or what I'm seeing at AACP, is that there are training programs in some schools that are extremely robust. So just as you're hoping to get a residency and doing the best you can in your APPEs, some schools have very particular milestones, very particular trainings to improve that applicant match rate over other schools. And as we're seeing this kind of competition for admissions, we're also seeing this competition for residency spots. So as it gets more competitive, you're going to see more schools making formal programs within the program, giving time off for people to do their residency interviews, uh, giving time for people to go to ASHP in the fall, uh, and all of those things. But I want to talk about the very first thing and the most important thing, which is what are your chances of matching? And again, this is a very broad number. So just because you can't just put two people together randomly that are in pharmacy school and say this one, these two people have a 64% chance. What they've done in school will up that percentage and what they haven't done will lower that percentage. So let's look at the PGY1 data from last year. So the PGY1 data, the applicants who enrolled in the match are 7,105. However, the way that ASHP looks at it is that if you enrolled in the match, you are not yet participating in the match. The next line is applicants who withdrew or did not return any rankings, and that's 1,168. Well, there's a document that shows you exactly the breakdown of that 1,168, and it was the next tab on there, and it's called the Summary Results of the Phase 1 Match for Positions Beginning in 2019. And so now when we break that number down, it actually says, okay, well, how many obtained a position uh, to an unaccredited residency, a fellowship, or employment as a pharmacist? So 8% of those did that. A third of those had no interview offers or no acceptable programs to rank. So it's saying that they returned this survey to say, why didn't you participate? Well, we didn't get an interview or we didn't get any programs. Others put that there was another reason. Maybe it was personal, maybe it was health, but whatever. And then no reason provided. I'm assuming this is the default so if you didn't actually respond to the survey, then it's no reason provided. But if you didn't get an interview, why would you ever go back into the match software to say, hey, I just wanted to make sure your data was up to date. I wanted to make sure that you knew that I didn't get any interview offers when it's clear that that's what happened. So when we now look at the numbers... I, what I want you to get as a take-home right now is that that 64% is, in many ways, artificially high. I don't want you to think your chances are 2 out of 3 when they're closer to 1 out of 2. So what I'll do instead of saying 1 is wrong and 1 is right, I'm just going to say there is a range. If you use the applicants enrolled in the match, then it is a... 54% match rate based on enrollment. If you use the participating number, it is a 64% match rate. 
match rate. So basically, if you got invited to one interview, your percentage goes up by 10% that you're going to match. Now, this is the one huge, huge, huge thing. At the bottom, we see that PGY app, PGY1 applicants, they're overwhelmingly 2019 graduates. 3,667 of those that match were 2019 graduates. Only 155 were graduates that were pre-2019. So the assumption is that, oh, okay, those were just people that didn't match last year. They came back this year. So 96% of those applying to the match are from the year that graduates, and 4% are not. What's going to happen, I believe, is that when those students become underemployed or unemployed, or the new the pharmacists become underemployed or unemployed, residency becomes a real viable thing again. So I'm predicting that the pre-2019 graduates are going to start creeping up and then start exploding in the number of people that are going to say, you know, I, I tried to do it without the residency. I didn't have it that I wanted to do a residency, but now I see that a residency is the only path to this particular job or that particular job that they want. So that's what I wanted to go over in, in this episode, is just to make clear that Residency application is going to get harder this year. That if you are in an APPE, you need to start looking at, okay, what are the things that I can do that will strengthen my application for a residency? And I'm going to give you something that you may not be thinking about at all. I'm going to actually give you two things. And Brandon Dyson of TLDR Pharmacy famously talks about this all the time. And uh, he was just on an interview with RX Ashley uh, talking about how he had a job that he had applied for. And it took him about 20 minutes to write an amazing cover page. And that didn't come from, wow, he's just a writing genius. That came from thousands and thousands of words that he's put up in TLDR that he understands the conventions of writing conventions of story, conventions of putting those together in such a way to make his unique. So my advice to you, bottom line advice to you, is to right now create two documents. Okay? The first document is a letter of intent. Okay? Why do you want to you do a residency? So the very first thing, how do you write that letter of intent? And I'll probably get much more specific as we get closer. Obviously, it's middle of July. But the letter of intent, all you have to do is just be a journalist. Okay? As If you're going to do a residency, who would you want to do the residency with? What kind of residency do you want to do after PGY-1, or what part of PGY-1 is important? Is it teaching? Is it research? What kind of what kind of hospital or community or administrative rotation do you want to do? Where do you want to do it? Do you need to stay close to home? Brandon Dyson uh, stayed in the D.C. area and made clear he wanted to, uh, that that was one of his prime considerations is that, look, I've lived in this area. I have a family. I'm really wanting to keep this all together. So location is really important. When do you want to do this residency? Are you going to give it a shot to go out into practice or are you going to uh, go right away? Why are you going to do the residency? Okay, well, I can't get a job without it, right? No, no, no. That's not where we want to go. Why do you want to do a residency is you probably have a patient population that's most important to you whether it's oncology, pain management, um, whether it's population health, whatever it is, your why should be very specific to a patient group, and that patient group should be very specific to the residencies that you're going to start looking for. 
there are thousands of residency positions. And how do you match thousands? You know, when you were going to pharmacy school, you had, I think it's now 150, I don't know the number, but there were 150 schools, but you clearly, clearly were not going to go to the majority of them. And so maybe there were 10 at most that you would consider. The, the average uh, applicant right now applies to between two and three, so 2.75 schools, something like that. How do you sort 3,000 instead of 150? So the first thing you do is, okay, well, what states would I consider? Okay. Well, what kinds of residency would I consider? Okay. How do I tier these in terms of what matters to me and what they offer and all of these things? Okay. So then how? So the last part is the how. And uh, I'll talk about the interview book that Brandon and I wrote, uh, 100, 100 Strong Residency Questions, Answers, and Rationales uh, in a later episode. But the how right now is if you can get this part down, if you can get this who, what, where, when, why, and how started, then the APPE you're in now and the APPE rotation you're in next or the job that you're in now and the job that you hope for next can start forming and you can all of a sudden start doing things and moving towards it in a much more organic way rather than, oh my gosh, uh, residency applications are due. Oh my gosh, I've got to find out who's going to be the person that's going to write my recommendation and you know how many residencies am I going to apply to? How am I going to get someone to write 14 residency recommendations and I'll talk about that in another episode it's actually not that hard I write them in and it's really set up very well for that that's the first thing the second thing I recommend you do and I hate recommending two things at once but is to write a teaching philosophy okay. whether you're talking about teaching as in counseling patients one-on-one -on -one, whether you're talking about teaching as in being in front of the classroom whether you're talking about teaching philosophy as how you approach making someone's life better, it doesn't matter. If you can put together a letter of intent, who, what, where, when, why, and how, that you want to do residency, and a teaching philosophy, how it is that you feel that you teach both patients and maybe students in the future, you will completely change the way that you look at each rotation and each rotation will now build on those two documents and you won't be sitting there at the end like many do and write a letter of intent in a day or two. The letter of intent in many of the rubrics that the RPDs use is weighed equally with your resume is weighed equally with your ex leadership experience. You're like, how can that be? How can a single page be so important? Because even though your resume says some about what you did, the only thing, the only place for you to talk about why you are doing this, why it's a good fit, and you'll only have 30 seconds. Somebody's going to read it for 30 seconds, maybe a minute if you're extremely engaging. This is the only time you have to make so clear that it's just actually a natural progression. We're great together. You know, it should look like a relationship. They're like, oh my gosh, how did we not meet? How did we not know each other before? We're perfect for each other. That's how the document should read. That's how the current resident who's there should be like, oh, totally one of us. Absolutely one of us. Man, we do not want to lose this person. Let's get that interview you know, request right away. So that's the kind of a document you want to write. But that doesn't come from a couple of days or a weekend before it's due. That comes from thoughtful reflection. That comes from experiences that are leading into your teaching and your residency goals. So, again, I went a little bit long on this first episode, but I want to make clear, residency is going to be a heck of a lot harder come this year. And I think that there are four forces that are going to cause that. One, there is no reduction in the number of graduates that I see in the next four or five years. So the same number of graduates are coming out. Two, the pre-2020 graduates are going to start coming in because 
their opportunities are not financially necessarily better than the residency. Three, those that are underemployed or unemployed currently in the market are going to start saying, well, actually, I probably could go back into the match and I probably could uh, go for a residency. And then number four, that's just where the, that's just where the profession's going. Um, saw on LinkedIn, you know, the, and they do this in Canada, they've got some in Arizona, uh, but they've got those uh, boxes that are basically a pharmacy in a box where somebody just goes up and has a, meets with a telepharmacist on, uh, on there. Uh, you saw that there, it was very recent. I feel so, so badly for these um, pharmacists, but 27 pharmacists were just let go uh, in Minnesota when they just closed 14 stores. And the pharmacists there thought they were doing okay, thought they were uh, doing that, and they were providing better service. Uh, but they didn't have the financial wherewithal with only 14 pharmacies. And then, of course, the, the large layoff that came a couple of weeks ago. So I'm not trying to be doom and gloom, not trying to uh, scare you, but what I'm trying to do is say, uh, if you do this now, you're going to have a lot better chance than if you do it later. Okay, so 234th episode that I've done on this kind of podcast, but uh, this is the first of the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Let me know what you think. Um, I am Tony PharmD1 on Facebook, so you can always get me there on Messenger, uh, or uh, you can reach out to me at aaguerra at dmac.edu. Uh, and I will continue to provide you with help uh, as you move along towards your residency or career. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook.